Good morning. Today is June the 20th, 2022. I'm Frank Farmer, and we're here today as part of the Veterans History Project. Today we have with us uh, Lieutenant General Jay Garner. General Garner served uh, over 35 years in the Army, rising from second lieutenant to lieutenant general, which is a three-star uh, position. He is a veteran of both uh, Vietnam. He is a veteran of the a military veteran of the uh, first Gulf War. He retired in 1997 with his uh, present rank of lieutenant general. After the war, he became a uh, senior advisor uh, to the United States government uh, on Iraq and uh, was appointed uh, to reconstruct the Iraqi government during the second uh, Gulf War after the fall of Saddam Hussein in 2003. Uh, general Garner, first of all, let me thank you, sir, for your years of service to this country and for coming here today uh, to, uh, to tell your story, sir. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate it. Okay. First of all, let's, uh, let's talk a little <coughs> bit about your Florida history. As I understand it, you're a native Floridian. Uh, tell us where you were born and where you grew up. you have any military uh, uh, background in your family? A long time ago. I was born and raised in Arcadia, Florida, which is about 110 miles south of here. Uh, I was born and raised on, my father's a small rancher, grove owner. Um, I'm the first person to be in the military since my great-grandfathers great joined the Confederacy in 1861, my grandfather on my father's side was in the 8th Infantry Regiment, Florida, Florida Volunteers. And on my mother's side, my grandfather was in the 10th Infantry Regiment, Florida Volunteers. And my grandfather on my mother's side surrendered with Lee at, App at Appomattox and walked home to Arcadia. So, so you do have some yeah, some, some family back. history. Yeah. Uh, had, yeah, to yeah. had to reach back a long ways. <laughs> Now, yeah. I, I know that uh, that growing up, you graduated from a high school in Arcadia. Mm -hmm. Originally, it was going to go to college, but uh, you started college to, at, at Florida Southern, I yep. think, and decided that that, uh, that was not uh, for you at the present time, and you joined the Marine Corps. Is that is that correct, sir? Partially. I didn't decide it wasn't for me. The dean of men decided it wasn't <laughs> for me and told me I ought to kind of mature a little bit, so I joined the Marine Corps. I went and joined the Marine Corps Reserve, then volunteered to go on active duty and went on active duty. Now, what year was that, sir? Uh, 1957. So you served? Uh, 57 to 58. Did you go to Paris Island for your? Uh, oh, yeah, 13 and a half weeks. And uh, I'm sure you had uh, some pretty vivid memories of uh, Paris Island. Yep, I did. And how long did you serve in the Marine Corps? Two years. And uh, what, what do you think about the Marine Corps training and what it taught you, sir? Oh, I think the Marine Corps is superb. Uh, it, it, it grew me. I'll tell you what, when I went back to college after I got out of the Marine Corps, I was on the dean's list every semester. So, <laughs> so you did learn yeah, you did learn taught a lesson. me a lot, yeah. And it was a, it's a great branch of service. The training is great. The leadership's great. Uh, they do a superb job of, of, of educating young Marines on the history of the Marine Corps. So it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful organization. Now, when you got out of the Marine Corps, you you said, "Well, I'm I'm ready for college now. I'm going to go back to college." I went back to college, correct? Yeah. And uh, you ended up at Florida State, is that correct? I did. How did you end up at uh, Florida State? I just went up there and said, "I want to, I want to come here next semester." And they said, "Okay." <laughs> was, that, that's true. was that that's was true. that? I, I didn't have a I didn't have a transcript or anything. And I said, "I don't have a transcript." They said, "Bring it when you come up here in January in uh, September." So I took it up there in September, gave them seventy five dollars, which was the Tuition then, Florida State. And that was what year, sir? 1959. 59. Yeah. And that was the admission process that at was, that, that was it. particular so the admission, time? The admission took me not more than an hour at the most. And what did and, and, and $75. <laughs> that was it. Now, what did you, uh, what did you major in at? Uh, what, what was your plans when you went to Florida State? Well, my plan, I wanted to be the governor of Florida. So I was going to go to Florida State and graduate, and then I was going to go to University of Florida Law School. And so I got married right after I got out of the Marine Corps. So my, my wife had, had, had gone to Florida Southern, graduated from Florida Southern. She, and she got a job as a legal secretary in Tallahassee. And so I, ma I liked geology. I majored in geology until the last semester, and they revamped the geology department. It would have caused me another semester to stay in college, and I didn't want to do that. So I loved history. I'd taken one or two history courses every semester. And my, the dean told me, he said, look, you, you, all you want to do is go to law school, so why don't you just... Uh, declare yourself a history major and graduate this year, this semester. And I said, that's what we'll do. But we had a, just had a child, and she had some complications, and I had a large medical bill. 
so I had taken ROTC, and so I accepted the commission in ROTC, and I went in the Army for 30 months. So you were commi you went through uh, ROTC, Army ROTC at— uh, Advanced at, ROTC. Yeah. I never took the basic right. ROTC. But. And you, uh, you graduated uh, what year? I graduated in uh, January of 62. And you were a, graduated a commission as a second lieutenant. A second lieutenant in artillery. One gold bar. Yep. And your branch you you uh, you selected was artillery. Yeah, one my first my choice was infantry, arm, and artillery. But there were only seven of us that graduated in the mid year, and we were all commissioned artillery. I don't think any of us chose artillery. We all but we were all commissioned artillery. Now, when you graduated <coughs> in '62, Vietnam was just starting to uh, to ramp yeah, yeah, up. I didn't know where Vietnam was when I first went there then. I didn't, you know, Vietnam didn't start heating up till about '64. So you had uh, you had a couple years of uh, training as a uh, as an artillery officer, and uh, I think you told me you were you went to Germany as a as yeah, that I was in Germany for two years. And, and I got I I <clears throat> and I, I uh, applied to law school. At University of Florida took the LSAT, passed it, got accepted to law school. So your got, plans were then to get to, yeah, you were going to get out of the yeah, military and go right, to law and yeah. still and still be still, the governor of uh, yeah yeah Florida. that was uh, yeah okay and so then I, I got out of law school I mean I got out of the army came home in uh, in uh, August to start in in in, uh, in September but they said no I had to wait till the following September so I taught school in our in, in Arcadia so I taught taught science and phys ed. And waiting to go to waiting to go to law school. Yeah, and then in the in the in the summer of of uh, sixty five, President Johnson put the one seventy third Airborne Brigade into into Vietnam. I saw, watched all that. I felt guilty. I called my old battalion commander up, who was then in the Inspector General's office in the Pentagon, and said, "Get me back in the Army." He called me back two nights later and said, "Okay, your orders are on the way." And he said, "I got one question for you, Jay." I said, "Yes, sir." He said, now I have to send an American flag down there for you and Connie to put on the foot of your bed so you'll never forget what your responsibilities are again. And I said, no, sir, I'll never forget again. So you, you went back in the went Army in yeah. 65 knowing yeah. you were going to go to Vietnam. Didn't know I was going to Vietnam. I went to Artillery Brigade in, in uh, Alabama and volunteered to go to Vietnam. And in Vietnam, you, what, was your, uh, what was your mission in Vietnam, your first tour of duty? Sir? I was an infantry advisor. To the uh, South Vietnamese? To, it, to the Vietnamese, yeah. But, to, I, but I never served with the Vietnamese. I served with the Montagnards up in the Central Highlands. Well, yeah. tell us about the Montagnards. We, we've heard a lot about the Montagnards. First of all, you were in two corps, I believe. Is yeah, that correct? Two yeah. corps. And if you look at a map of South Vietnam and it's go the large, up, It's the largest corps. It's long. Large, yeah. And it, if you go up to the border <laughs> between uh, South Vietnam and, at that time, North Vietnam is one corps, and then you come down south, two corps, and then a three corps. Yeah. Two Corps was up in the mountainous regions where the Montagnards lived, and you yeah. said you were two, two Corps went from the from the uh, from the ocean uh, westward to uh, to Cambodia and Laos. Now, the, tell us about the Montagnards. Who, who are the Montagnards? And they're the, they're the indigenous people of Vietnam, like the American Indians are the indigenous people of the United States, and they look like American Indians. I mean, they're 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 taller than Vietnamese. They're muscular. Uh, they're they're not fine looking people. The Montagnards I was with were the, was the Coho tribe, which is a very good tribe. The, my special forces buddies dealt always with Montagnards, and they ranked the Coho tribe second. The Rade tribe, they ranked up the best, and the Coho second. And so they those. were technically South Vietnamese they were citizens, people. but they were they were yeah, a separate they, yeah, entity. Yeah, and they were all volunteers because there was no draft system in Vietnam. So, um, and... So they they were all they'd all volunteered to be in the army. And the unit I had was a scout company, the four or seventh Montagnard Scout Company, part of the twenty third Vietnamese Infantry Division. And what was your opinion of the Montagnards as a fighting force and as Excellent. an ally? Excellent. They had a we had a forty seven to one kill ratio until Tet, and then we took a lot of casualties in Tet, but uh, they were they were excellent fighters. Did very the Montagnards very loyal too? Very loyal. Montagnards speak their own language. Yeah. Did you learn to speak? Uh, not a word. No. Not a word. I went. I went to Vietnamese language school for four months. Went over there. Never spoke a word of Vietnamese. Or because I was with the Montagnards. <laughs> what? So, uh, how? How were the Montagnards treated by the uh, at that time the South Vietnamese government? I, I've heard they weren't treated real well. 
no, they weren't treated real well. The, the South Vietnamese government always uh, took advantage of them, persecuted a lot of them. And I just went back to Vietnam two years ago, and I went back through everywhere I'd been on my first two tours. Of course, I couldn't go in the jungle, but on the road and all that. In the villages, I didn't see one, one mock yard. So I guess that after we, after we left Vietnam, they either moved them all out or they killed all of them or something. So they were never, they were never good to the mock yards. So and the mock yards didn't like the Vietnamese either. So there were animosity between the, yeah. those, those two, uh, those two entities. And uh, speaking of the, uh, I'll tell you a story. I was, one evening we put out our ambushes, and I walked back up in the first sergeant, mine yard first sergeant, and was sitting on a rock smoking his pipe. And I said, hey, first sergeant, I said, um, why are you in the Army? Why are all you guys in the Army? Because you can't get drafted. They can't make you go in the Army. So why are you there? He thought a minute. He said, pay's better than picking tea. <laughs> I said, well, I understand it. And then he took another smoke pipe, and he said, and anybody I kill is a Vietnamese. <laughs> <laughs> that explains it. Oh, so that, well, that, that, yeah, that tells you the, well, the, the relationship. Uh, that, yeah. That, that, yeah, that kind of explains yeah. the relationship between that. And, uh, yeah. you know, we, there were 50,000 Americans that uh, were killed uh, yeah. uh, in, in yeah. Vietnam. And uh, we were there for supposedly, uh, statedly, our role was to help the uh, South Vietnamese. What was your, now you said you, you weren't with the South Vietnamese, but you must have formed an opinion uh, the ability of the South Vietnamese Army uh, troops. Uh, well, the South, the South. I, I what I meant. I didn't serve with any South Vietnamese units, uh, but the South Vietnamese. The, all the officers were Vietnamese, and the, all the like the division staff. All those they were all Vietnamese. So I, I served with Vietnamese officers, but not not soldiers because the unit I had was a Montagnard okay. unit. Although it was it was led by uh, by South Vietnamese. Officer, he wasn't South. He was from North Vietnam. He had been a runner for for the Viet Minh against the French when he was when he was twelve, thirteen years old. But he was a Catholic and Christian. And when when uh, Ho Chi Minh and all took over the North, he and his family came South because he was a Catholic. And he was a, he was an excellent company commander. He's the only real good leader that I saw in, in two tours over there. Although now I'll tell you this. A lot of my airborne buddies and special forces buddies will tell you the the Vietnamese they served with were exceptional. They were very good. So there so, were some. Oh, I'm sure there. Were, I'm sure there's some really good ones. Yeah. But overall, I guess yeah. I, overall, overall, I'd say the Montagnards were better fighters than the than the Vietnamese. Did you ever form any, any opinion about the uh, South Vietnamese government when you were over there about how effective the South Vietnamese government was going to be in forming a cohesive uh, defense? Uh, and driving out uh, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, or, or what was your opinion of that, uh, sir? You know, Frank, I was at such a low level. I didn't, I didn't have much. Thought. You know, the only, the only thing I thought about every now and then, you, you get all these, these, newsreel flashes of Win Cao Key. You know, Win Cao Key was very flamboyant. He was a fighter pilot and all that kind of stuff, uh, and Jim, uh, but I didn't have any opinion of their government because I didn't, I didn't really. I didn't really operate with it. My thought was right there where I was. Didn't have any, didn't have any higher thoughts than that. Now you were in Vietnam uh, during your two tours of. By the way, you, when you went back for your second tour, what were the years of that? First tour was 67, 68. Second tour was 71, 72. Okay. Uh, were you ordered back, or is it the time to you rotate back, or did you volunteer to go back for your second tour? No, I was. Uh, I I came back for my first tour and I went to. To um, the officer's career course, then I got stationed in Panama. I'd been down in Panama for 11 months, and I got a call one Saturday from the Pentagon telling me I, that they just put me on levy to go back to Vietnam. So, so you're so I, now you were in uh, your first tour. You were there during the most one of the most consequential battles of the Vietnam War, yeah, the Tet Defensive, which was in Tet. January, February 1968. Yeah, January, February, March. Yeah. What. Uh, what was your opinion of the tactical and the uh, strategic results of, of that battle for the United States? Well, first of all, we were surprised. I mean, they, they caught us by surprise. That's number one. Uh, and I think the, the news really concentrated on the fact we got caught by surprise. And, it, it, and they, they, all of Vietnam was at war almost. You know, all, every city was under attack. To the, almost every large city was under attack. But 
and I think the news concentrated on that. But the fact of the matter is, once we once we got going, we defeated them soundly. We killed them by the thousands. In fact, we devastated them so much that they could not mount another attack until 1971. Uh-huh. So we we absolutely de- we destroyed the the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army during. That time. I think most of the uh, 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 stories that have been written by professionals. Uh, say that that yeah. the uh, the Viet Cong and the uh, uh, and and the North Vietnamese are, were were devastated by the set of, yeah. but it it turned out to be kind of a turning point uh, in in the war because it was that that battle that seemed to galvanize the opposition uh, uh, to, to a great extent. Where no 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 the problem with that was Walter Conkright. Walter Conkright went over and brought his fat ass back and started telling the president and everybody we couldn't win that war and all that. And Lyndon Johnson capitulated and made his great speech in March of 68 that he wouldn't run again. He was going to try to solve the war. And everything went downhill from there. So so even though so, we the uh, Viet Cong and, uh, were, were devastated, they were simply, people's authorities say that they had nothing left. And what you've, you've said also, they had not much left militarily, uh, but yeah. yet it turned out that... Uh, Seemed like they came out on the better side with uh, the, the public relations well, and we, what happened. We, we we lost the war to them politically through through the media and through through uh, the president, and then we uh, and then we we never took the war to them. I mean, we should have taken a page out of World War Two. I should have gone up there and bombed the hell out of them, bombed the Red River dikes, flooded the damn place, and then entered North Vietnam, and it would all have been over. Well, that that yeah. leads me to the next next question that. Uh, we we lost over fifty thousand men and women in Vietnam, yeah. th- hundreds of thousands more wounded, yeah. kind of tore the nation apart, pretty much tore the military apart. Yeah. I, I it, think it in, in many ways, uh, and I think you've already expressed part of my next question. What do you think the United States uh, uh, should have done, didn't do, or did wrong in in looking back on Vietnam, sir? Well, I I, I think. I think there's a laundry list of that. I mean, you know, at, at, at the op- operational level or strategic level, like what I just said, we should have we should have gone in and taken the the war to them. You think that we could have that would have ended the war? Yeah, I do. I really believe that. The second thing, I think the uh, in in the war, the, the management of the of the units was was not done very well. I mean, you went over for one year and you came home. So, uh, and then the next guy came over. He started right where you were when you first got there, and then he went home. So. I think you should have gone over there until, like they did in World War II, until, until you, the, the thing was over. Well, that's been one of the criticisms and, and by. So, uh, and so what they happened, what happened then is, is then they came up with all these wild programs that didn't work. Like we had what we call shake and bakes. They take the top three grads out of out of basic training and make them non-commissioned officers. Well, they weren't they weren't non-commissioned. Non-commissioned officers, the guy that grows into that over years. I mean, non-commissioned officers are extremely professional. They're the backbone of the army, and that that began to break the army because you had all these non-commissioned officers who, who were wearing the stripes, but they didn't have the experience or anything. So, you lost a lot of the backbone of the army, I think, in, in those times. Now I'm talking out of turn because I never served with the U.S. unit in two, in two tours in Vietnam, but that we suffered from that for years after the Vietnam War until we until we rectified all that, which we did, but it took, it took five or six years to do Well, that. I think that's what many experts would say, yeah, that yeah. the United States Army, I guess all the military, yeah, suffered yeah. tremendously yeah. Uh, from the effects of the, uh, of the Vietnam War, and it took years uh, for the military branches uh, to recover, yeah. as you've, uh, as you've uh, pointed and out. Di- dis- discipline eroded over that time in the units. So you had drugs were rampant, you, know, had, you had in some units, uh, the soldiers or Marines tried to frag their, their their company commanders or platoon leaders or stuff like that. So, so discipline eroded a lot. And it took it took several years after that was over for us to put all that back together again. Do you think the erosion of discipline was just a result of the weariness of the uh, of the war among the troops and the the, the opinions that were arising? Uh, I, I think it was number one. The part of it was the length of the war. It kept going on. Number two, it was an unpopular war. It became, it became very unpopular. And number three, the, I think a big part of it is the way the, the, everything was handled. With, by, you know, like I went over there 
And the guy that replaced me, he started from ground zero, you know, because he had to learn everything I'd learned. So they should just left me there until we were so well, there, there was a lot there was awful lot of that. And so you you know, I, I was on a during Ted I went on a a, a short operation with a, a, a reinforced rifle company from the hundred first Airborne. It's a good company. And uh every night uh the non-commissioned officers would go get the Ford Observer, the artillery Ford Observer, who's first, first lieutenant, and talk to him about what the company commander said and all that. So about the third night I went and I said, let me ask you something. Who the hell's the company commander, you or, or the captain? There? He said, no, you don't understand. He said, we've been over here almost a year. We've been here 10 months, this company. And he said, he's the sixth company commander. And he said, I'm the only guy that started out with this company. He said, so they come to me because they feel comfortable with me. And I think that was across the board. You know, nobody stayed in command very long uh, in, in, in the U.S. units. Now, when did you come home from your second tour, sir? From my second tour? Yes, sir. Uh, I came home uh, in March of 72. What was your rank at that time? I was a major. Major? I was a captain my first tour, major my second tour. And so you had uh, decided to stay in the uh, Army, make a career oh, yeah. of it. Yeah, sure. Over the next 20 years, as you advanced in rank and you you – were assigned more responsibility. Uh, you commanded over the next 20 years uh, two battalions. You commanded a brigade. Yeah. You commanded a uh, command, I think, the uh, uh, space and... Uh, no, I com commanded uh, two battalions, brigade. Um, tell us, Fort, tell Fort, us about I that. commanded Fort Bliss, Texas, and then uh, a joint task force in northern Iraq in 91. So, so that was uh, during the 1980s that you were... That, that was from... 72 to to 92 okay 20, 20 years so uh and so as you advanced and you uh it said you went on D didn't you have something to do with the uh, uh the initiative on the missile defense uh that the united states was was working on during those years not during those years those 20 years but uh when i when i came back from the gulf war in 91 as a major general I became the director of, of uh, really of modernization for the army. So I had I had the modernization of all weapons, of which that was one. And then I got promoted to lieutenant general, and, and I took over command of space and missile defense command. Well, and the national missile defense system, Star the Star Wars thing, came under under that command. Well, I want so to I talk to you about that. So the first yeah. of all, I want to talk to you about uh, the first Gulf War. The first Gulf War was. Of course, occurred in uh, 1991 when Saddam yeah, Hussein yeah. invaded uh, Kuwait, yeah. and we had a response. And uh, I think you commanded uh, a task force during that period of time, didn't I, you know? Well, when that started, before it started, I was the deputy commanding general of the Fifth Corps in Germany. The Fifth Corps was was an armored armored corps, about about 60,000 soldiers. And uh, when the Gulf War started, uh, they took two of the four divisions we had in Germany put them in the Gulf. And then as it ended, you remember the president, the first George Bush, went on air and he told the the Shia in the south of south uh, southern part of Iraq and the Kurds in the northern part of Iraq to revolt against Saddam Hussein and overthrow him. Well they both did that. But the problem is, while they were getting ready to do that, Schwarzkopf signed, General Schwarzkopf signed the surrender agreement, and that released the Iraqi army. And so Saddam Hussein sent the Iraqi army in to f fight the Shia in the south. And the Shia, the Shia had no army. Uh, so they just rounded them up and slaughtered them. They, uh, when I went back there in 2003, we were digging up the killing fields, and, they, and uh, what an old man there, a farmer, he said he used to watch it. They come in and... Uh, bring them up by the hundreds and just walk down, shoot them in the head and bury them. He said after that they machine gunned because they couldn't kill them fast enough. And he said finally after that they just dug trenches and st stuff and just threw them in there and buried, buried a lot of them alive. But we would, dig, we would dig up bodies, hundreds of bodies every day. And you knew who everybody was because they had to carry a laminated ID card that was by law there. So everybody, while there was, their bodies were all decomposed and their clothes and all, you still had that laminated ID card there with but what happened up north is the Kurds up north had an army called the Peshmerga. Now this means, was Peshmerga means this all occurred. Uh, this all occurs, occurred after. Uh, this is March. This is March of ninety one, 
till August, September of 91. And so the Kurds fought the Iraqi army and initially defeated them. But the Kurds were just light infantry. They didn't have any tanks. They didn't have any mechanized artillery. They didn't have any aircraft, anything like that. And so after the surrender agreement was signed, the Republican guards uh, and the armored divisions went up north and they crushed the Kurds. And so the Kurds fought a rear guard action to allow all the old people and the women and children to evacuate into the mountains of Turkey and the mountains in, uh, in Iran. And so what happened is they were dying at the, in the mountains at the rate of a thousand a day because it was, it was still close, freezing up there in the mountains. And so John Major called Bush and said, we got to do something about this. So we got to call in Germany. Uh, Charlie Kashvili was the deputy commander, uh, the deputy commander of all forces in Germany as a three star. I was a deputy commander of the armored, armored corps there. I was a two star. And he and I were sent there to make a, a, an estimate of what we should do. Well, we never left. We got up there and said this. And so we, we got a pickup team and went into northern Iraq. Charlie stayed in Turkey and said, command post in Turkey. I went in northern Iraq. I air mobiled in there with the with the second of the eighth Marines. Uh, and we set up a, a began to set up a security zone, expand it greater and greater, push the Iraqis out of there. And then we built we built villages, tent cities and things like that and brought the Kurds back. So and, and let me get all this chronologically correct. The first first Gulf War, Saddam the same uh, army is defeated. They're they're kind of crushed, but he uh, he then goes on a, uh, a killing spree. Saddam Hussein was a, uh, a Sunni. Is that correct? Yeah, he's Sunni. See, the Sunnis were about 30% of Iraq, and the Shia were about 60% of Iraq. Both yeah, Muslim. Both Muslim. And the Kurds about 10%, 10 or okay. 12%, something like that. So when uh, Saddam Hussein went on a, uh, it's it kind of hard to, for many people to imagine that the animosity that existed between uh, the Shia and the Sunnis, uh, both of the same major religion, but yet pretty much deadly enemies, like I the, think. Like, like the, the Brits and Irish. <laughs> so, uh, happens so Saddam, all, happens all over the world. <laughs> so Saddam Hussein was uh, determined to wipe out uh, the Shias. Yeah, and, yeah. And did he? He was gonna make them pay for, for turning on him, both of them. Was there? Uh, did he? Did he use? Is there any evidence he used poison gas uh, at that time against? Uh, well, he had, he had he had gassed the Kurds real well back in 1988, and had killed. He had gassed the entire village of Halabja, killed everybody in Halabja. He gassed a lot of people. When I went into Iraq in '91, uh, he had gone up there. He had destroyed 4,000 villages in in Kurdistan. And he, he not only destroyed them, he, he, I mean, he really, he brought in rock crushers and crushed everything. You, you could go in a destroyed village and, and you couldn't find a rock in there that you couldn't pick up because the, 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 the destruction was so complete. So he, he, wanted to, he wanted to get rid of all the Kurds and he wanted to really punish the Shia, um, which he did. Uh, but we got up there and we pull the Kurds out and we put in a no-fly zone and the Kurds were able then to develop a lot faster and a lot better than, than the, the Arab Iraqis. Uh, so so the, the, Kurds, uh, the Kurds are, are uh, Iraqi citizens, but they're, I, I kind of compare them a little bit to the Montagnards in, uh, in Vietnam, that they're a separate... Uh, uh, they're Eurocentric. They're, yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're not Arab. You know, they're not Turkish. Uh, they're not Persian. Uh, you have most most Kurds are dark complected, dark hair, dark eyes. But you find blonde headed Kurds and blue eyed Kurds and red headed Kurds and green eyed Kurds. I guess you, I guess they're whatever, whatever the the Crusader looked like that came through there and raped their great great grandmother. You know. So, so. Now, and, and the Kurds are a, a group of people who not, not only lived in uh, northern Iraq, they're they're in Turkey, they're in uh, they're in, Iran, they're, they're in they're in Iran, they're in uh, the southern part of Turkey, <clears throat> they're in the the northwestern part of Iran, the southern part of Turkey, and the northern all oh, the northern part of Syria and the northern part of Iraq. The smallest number of Kurds are the ones in Iraq. The Kurds in Iraq are probably about seven seven to eight million. 
Now, there are many uh, experts, uh, and I, I think, and the Kurds themselves, that uh, have wanted to form their own nation state, uh, don't they? Yeah, sure. They're, they're the largest group of people in the world that don't have a country. You know, so they're, they're, but the, the Kurds are not homogeneous. Uh, they're like the, first of all, everybody, everybody over there, Arab and Kurd, whatever, they're all tribal. But the, the Kurds are like, like American Indians, you know, you, you never could have had a, a, a national confederation of Indians because the tribes were too different. So the, the, it would be hard, I think, for all, all the Kurds to come together uh, because they're, they're, they are different and they have different beliefs. Plus, the countries that they live in won't allow that to happen because they don't, they, they don't want that strong federation of Kurds. Well, Turkey considers some parts of uh, the Kurdish people to be terrorists, do they? Well, they, they, there's an element of the Turkish Kurds called the PKK, and they are terrorists, and they're on our terrorist list, too. We consider them terrorists also. But, you know, the 95% of the of the Turkish Kurds are not terrorists. I mean, they're just citizens of Turkey. Uh, but the most advanced Kurds over in the whole region are the Kurds that are in Iraq. Okay. I mean, they, they have their own government. They have their own president. They have their own prime minister. their own police force. They have their own army. Uh, they're, they're, they're more modern than the rest of Iraq. Their roads are better than the rest of Iraq. Uh, they have uh, better employment than the rest of Iraq. Uh, so that they, they are, that they've governed themselves for a long time. Now, Saddam Hussein, you said, tried to destroy them, get rid of them, subjugate them. It never, never succeeded in doing it, you said. He, because, he came close. Because of us, yeah. Because uh, yeah. of the, uh, now that was part of the, the task force that you, uh, Commander that was up in that that yeah, area. What, what happened is when we when we went in there in uh, in late March of '91, both uh, Bush and John Major put out the call for the for the Allies to to uh, support us, and so I, I got I had I had the task force in northern Iraq, and it was composed of uh, British commandos. Were you a major general at that time? Yeah, it was, okay. it was British commandos. I had uh, the 8th Infantry Regiment from Spain, which was the first time the Spanish had deployed out of Spain since 1898 when they deployed to fight us in, Cuba, in the Spanish-American War in Cuba. They had the 8th Parachute Regiment from France. I had the Folgori Brigade, which is a composite Special Forces Mountain Brigade from Italy. Uh, I had the, uh, the Dutch Marines. I had the U.S. Marines. And I had uh, Army Parachute Rifle Battalion out of Vicenza, Italy. So, These are all they, part of your command. Yeah, yeah, and they were all elite troops. They're, they're either they're all either Marines, or commandos, or paratroopers. Now you, you've already expressed, I think, the answer to the next question. Uh, uh, your opinion of the Kurds as a fighting force and as a uh, excellent, excellent as a, fighting force, and they they uh, they they fight above their weight. And so they were they were a formidable uh, foe against Saddam Hussein. Then they were, but the pro the problem. When they faced Saddam Hussein, like I said before, they were light infantry, and they didn't have, they didn't have the mechanized the tanks and things like that. Now, what they've done, though, in the in the in the years since that time, they've um, they've fared pretty well against those guys because they've gotten anti-tank weapons and things like that. And so they're and they're they're very good at, you know, when ISIS attacked, the ISIS overran the whole Iraqi army, but they didn't overrun the Kurds, and the Kurds held a line from Syria. To Iran, a thousand kilometers, uh, holding back ISIS while the giving the Iraqi army time to go regroup, retrain, refit, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Now, when you came, you that was uh, in 1991. Yeah. And you were there for how long, sir? From March until I guess about August. And then you came back to the states, and then and it, went back to Germany to Fifth Corps till. Uh, December, and then I came back to the States and went to the Pentagon as the Director of Force Development, which is moder the modernization yeah. thing about the Army. Now, what uh, did you play a role in the, in the missile uh, defense or the attempts to have a missile defense at that time? Uh, yeah, that was part of it, but you know, I, I had everything. I had the tanks, the mechanized vehicles, the artillery, the missiles, the airplanes, the helicopters, the, everything that takes to modernize an Army. But... Uh, national missile defense, what what we you know we call uh, strategic uh, strategic space war thing, that was a big item. So we we did a lot with that. The problem with that though, 
is it was only going to be one unit, and that unit was going to be in Alaska. And so, you 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 if if you have that one unit, a unique unit, the only one like it in in the whole U.S. military, then you you assign people to it, and they never leave. If they never leave, there's not promotions and things like that. I mean, so it's it, it doesn't work. So what I did is I, I got hold of the National Guard and I had them take that over and it became a National Guard unit because the National Guard is excellent at doing that kind of, they did better than the Army at doing that type of thing. And so it became a National Guard unit. And the, the, uh, the purpose was to be able to defeat, defend against a, uh, a missile attack? A, lim a limited missile attack. So there never was a, I, I, I guess that there was hope at some point that the United States could come up with some type of a system that would defend itself completely against a, uh, at that time, a Russian, I guess that was the main threat, a Russian uh, internuclear missile attack. But that never happened. Did you? you know, the, uh, the National Missile Defense System, like I said, is in Alaska. And they, 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 don't, they have maybe somewhere between 40 and 50 missiles. So they're, they're, they're a good deterrent against the missiles launched from North Korea or missiles launched from Iraq or somewhere like that it's from a country that doesn't have a, law, a large inventory of missiles. No help against the Chinese or the Russians because they have you know, thousands of missiles. So I guess the uh, doctrine of mutual destructive... Uh, that went away. That, that, went away with, that went away when the uh, when the wall came down. So what is what is our what is our what is our doctrine now in regard uh, to uh, defending ourselves against uh, intercontinental missile uh, attacks, uh, atomic missile attacks? Do we have a doctrine, or yeah, it's called hope. <laughs> okay, that that's about where we are yeah, right now. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, I guess uh, Russia and China also have uh, that, that got, same they, doctrine, they, don't they? Well, they, yeah, they, they. That's true. N none of us have a good anti-missile defense for intercontinental ballistic missiles and and it, it is a it would be a, a case of mutual destruction if if who was being attacked decided to counter that attack again, okay. so okay so so after the uh, after the first uh, gulf war saddam hussein still in power still uh still there's not much you can say good about a dictator but a dictator sometimes is able to hold a country together by force, by threats, or from various uh, competing uh, factions that, if he or she were not there, would disintegrate. And that's, that's essentially, I think, what happened. And I will get to that after the second Gulf War. But you came back, sir. You retired in 1997. Mm -hmm. And then I think you became a senior civilian uh, advisor to the United States government. Is that that correct? No, not, not quite. What happened is when I retired in 97, in 98, the Congress created a commission to look at what, what, where, what had the United States done in space and where, where were the, the, uh, where were the problems we had in space? What were we doing good? What did we need to do? And he created a commission, and they made the, the, the head commissioner of that Donald Rumsfeld. And then each of the services nominated someone to go on that commission. Well, I got nominated to go on it myself and, and, uh, and, and a four-star general named name, uh, General Otis, uh, Glenn Otis. He and I were from the Army. So I spent a year on that commission with Rumsfeld. And the purpose of that commission was, was to look at what 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 are we doing in space, and what should we be doing, and and where are we? How credible are we in space? And so, at the end of that, we made our report to Congress, and it's like everything else you do like that, nothing ever came of it. But as we ended that, uh, the second Bush got elected president, and uh, that's two thousand, and he named Rumsfeld as his Secretary of Defense. So this commission I was on was from 99 to 2000 with Rumsfeld. So when the, the second war, Gulf War starts heating up in 2002, in January 2003, I got a call from Rumsfeld's office to come see them. So I went to see them, and they said, you know, we're, we're going to go to war, we're pretty sure. And when we, when we go in to Iraq, we need a staff that's able to 
start putting the country back together and can can bring everything back to normal and run the country. And so you, we want you to put that staff together, and you'll probably never go to Iraq because the president will take someone of statue, like a former governor or something, and put them in charge of it. Well, I think what happened is I put the staff together. I got it from the interagency. You know, I got it from the State Department, the CIA, Treasury, Agriculture. And this, tre- this, all this, stuff. this group was supposed to help or advise about putting the government back, of together. back together. Back after, together. They, yeah, they back knew together. that Saddam Hussein was going to fall. Yeah, we, we knew all that. But so we're, we're going to bring the country, lift the country back up again, and get, it run, get it running again with the Iraqis. And, and what did happen is, of course, when Saddam Hussein fell in 2003, after uh, and it started the second Gulf War, the country kind of disintegrated, didn't it, into the various factions, the Shias, the Sunnis, the various tribal fractions uh, uh, that were that, that had been held together by fear of him, I suppose. Not, not at first. Not at first. What ha- happened is when we went in there, um, the Sunnis hated us. Because they'd just been displaced. And that was Saddam Hussein's say. The the Shia did not trust us at all because the first Bush had had them riot or rebel against Saddam Hussein, and then they all got killed. I mean, thousands of them got killed, and we didn't do anything to help them. So they didn't trust us at all. And they were sitting on the fence to see what we'd do. And then the third bunch was the Kurds. They loved us because we had helped them in 91 and we just overthrown Saddam Hussein. That's the best thing could ever happen to them. So from, from Baghdad south, uh, everything was a problem. Baghdad north, very few problems because the Kurds did The Kurds caused us no problems at all. In fact, they were very helpful. So down south what happened is, is Saddam Hussein had, he had let all the criminals out of jail uh, about about a month before the war started. And turn I, them out I, on the streets? Yeah, turn them right out on the streets. I mean, bad, bad people. And then the, the second thing was that that uh, <coughs> the, the Sunnis ran everything, generally. And they were all Baathist, you know, like, like the Germans were Nazis, you know. And so we, we uh, Rumsfeld asked me, he said, what are you going to do about the Baathist when you get over there? And I said, here's what I think. I think that once we overthrow Saddam Hussein, the Shia and the Kurds together will kill most of the Baathist leaders. And then we'll just, as we find a bad one, we'll, we'll take care of it. But we won't replace them because they run the country. They run everything. They're all the school teachers. They're all the doctors. They're all the lawyers. They're all the, the public servants. They're the engineers. They're everything. And so when we went in there, we didn't bother the Baathists. And so what we did we set up we had two or three major goals one goal we had 10 tasks that had to be done and, and they were like uh, you got to harvest the crop you got you got to train and replace the police force police weren't trained in, in, in all right well, you want to be a cop you went down there and signed up they gave you gave you a nine millimeter in a uniform you went on duty that night um, we, we had to stop any outbreak of, of, uh, of disease like plague. Be- plague was a big problem. Uh, we had to solve the fuel crisis. There's no fuel in it. We had to solve the, the food distribution system. Um, we, we, so we're, there were 10 things like that. And I took one of my top leaders, which would be somebody from the interagency, like a former ambassador or something like that. And then Dave McKiernan, who was the land force commander, took one of his generals. And we married them together on each task. And we began to do those tasks. And the second thing was to write a constitution. And so what I did, I brought in seven, seven Iraqi leaders who he, we had been working with for two years before the war. And they were t- like, there were two Kurds, Taliban and Brazani, and then they were uh, Joffrey, Alawi, uh, Pachichi, Hakim, uh, Shalabi. And I brought them to Baghdad and I put them together at Baghdad, and I said, okay, here's what you're going to do. Every night you're going to go in there. One of you guys, you pick out which one's going to go in the air, and you're going to talk to the people for 30 minutes to an hour. And you would tell them what we're doing. We're writing the Constitution. We're going to have a, have a, have a democratic government. Everything's going to be better, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I don't want my face to be on TV because I want it to be your face. I don't, I, I'm, I don't want to be, them to think of me as the leader because what happens, we're in a period of liberation. 
and, and liberation only lasts for a short amount of time. Once you once liberation's over, you're in occupation. Once you get an occupation, you got a hell of a mess on your hands. So I didn't want to. I didn't. I didn't. I wanted to keep the liberation window open. And in order to do that, I, I minimized uh, my my appearances with the people on TV, radio, and stuff like that. And I went to the villages and towns and cities. I talked to everybody all the time. <clears throat> and so that worked. That worked pretty good. And then we put together a constitutional committee, and we're getting ready to write a constitution. And what I wanted to do in that, and I talked it over with the, with the seven leaders, and we were going to write a, in the Constitution, we were going to write a, a federal system where the Constitution would produce a federal system, which means you had the Kurds in the north, the, the Sunnis in the middle, and the Shia in the south. And each one of them would be quasi-independent, and they would have their own leadership. But the Baghdad would still be the government, but it would be a weaker government. You know, they'd send somebody to OPEC. They'd send somebody to the United Nations. They would delineate the currency. They'd come up with the rules for education, health care, all that kind of the things that, they, that governments do. But we wanted the power of government to be felt in the, in the federal system. And the reason for that is because they're tribal. And, and all, the whole problem in the Middle East now, in Iraq especially, is that you, you had Churchill and Gertrude Bell and all them draw lines with a big fat grease pencil, you know, a hundred and something years ago, with no thought about the ethnicity, the religion, or the tribes. So what we were trying to do is get them back where they were homogeneous, live with each other, so they're not fractioned against each other. But all that ended because I, I left, and, uh, and when, when Ambassador Bremer came in, he didn't want to do it that way, so he didn't do it that way. So what happened then is is they they put off writing the Constitution, and we ended up writing the the uh, the draft of the Constitution. I didn't, I wanted them to write it, um, and then he said he set himself. I'm not criticizing, but I'm just telling you the difference between two. He set himself up as as the guy that was in charge of everything, and so he was the the face of government to the Iraqi people and that didn't go over in the end and uh, he so that he he put out the the debathification law the second day it was air attack we had the debathification law and I Brimmer, Brimmer gets blamed for that but I, I don't think he did that I think that came out of DC I'm afraid I know it came out of DC Brimmer's too smart to have done something like that I think but when when he did that uh, it went down four levels of government and disqualified any of those Bathists from having a job. So anybody that had been a Bathist prior to, sort of, they were excluded they under, were, under, under, the, under, under our debathification process. You know, and we, those, those we didn't were, do that in Germany. No, we didn't do that to the Nazis in Germany. But we did it to, to the Iraqis. Then the second thing they did, he did, is he disbanded the army. Well, we were going to bring the army back uh, from colonel down. Now, we're, going to bring, we're going to bring the generals back from colonel down. We're going to bring them back because the army has skills. they got a, they got a command and control system. They're organized. They can do hundreds of things. They can clean up rubble. They can have security. They can do hundreds of things for you. And so we had, the day Bremer got there, we had 40,000 Iraqi soldiers ready to sign back up. And we had the same, I had the same company doing that that had built the Croatian army during the Balkan War under, under Clinton. And so they did away with the army. Well, what happened then is you had 200, 200, 300,000 soldiers that we had told we had dropped leaflets, millions and millions of leaflets before the war started about, you know, you don't want to fight us. What you want to do is go put on your civilian clothes, take your, take your rifles and put them under the bed and hide them. And when we come back, when we take over the country, we're going to bring you back and you back, bring you back as soldiers. Well, when they did away at the army, you, we had 300,000 people out of jobs who were armed, all armed. And then the third thing they did was... was so they never, so under the new plan, they did not bring these people back into the no, army? No, hell no, they, they didn't bring any back, no. And so the, the, th the, the third thing was they got rid of the seven leaders that we had put together. And we those, we'd put the leaders together two years before that. So the... The third, the, the second day, Ambassador Bremer was there. The first IED went off. Never had an IED go off before. The first one off, and then it all, the 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 rebellion started, and all that kind of stuff started. 
So, so the the criminals we brought are, we brought that on ourselves. So the I criminals are out on the street. The army uh, our, have no jobs. Our army has no job. The Baptists have no jobs. And uh, to, what do the Iranians do during this period of time? The Iranians, the Iranians are very very smart, very crafty. Um, what the Iranians have done, what they saw all this coming, and, and you got to remember the Shia are very, the Iranians are Shia. And the Shia in the South were very close to the Iranians, and and most of the most of the Shia leaders went over and lived in Iran when Saddam Hussein was in power. So they all came back, and what the Iranians did is, as we would move through and free up towns, the Iranians would just they would just silently go in there and they took over the hospital system, the police system, uh, the finance system, the trash system, uh, everything that had to do with quality of life, food distribution system, all that. So that as, as we cleared towns, the Iranians just silently took them over and, had, and they held everything that had quality of life for the people. So they, they became a great influence Yeah, they, in, they were, with the Iraqi they people. Became the, they became a huge influence. And that, uh, that and exists? Well, today, Iran runs Iraq today. I mean, Iraq's a puppet state of Iran today. They're everything except up north where the Kurds are. The Kurds haven't submitted to them yet but if we pull out of there they will they'll have to they'll have no choice but from from i'd say 60 or 70 kilometers north of baghdad all the way south uh down to to jordan and kuwait it's all run by the iranians controlled by that's the a that's an ominous that's an ominous well, they, they have they have the they, they, they take they have all the paramilitary units who are trained in Iran, led by Iran. They the, the Iraqi parliament has brought them into their army as part of their army. Now you got Iraqi Iranian units that are part of the Iraqi army, recognized by the government. That's because the parliament is, is run by controlled by the Iranians. The Iranians are taking over the court system, the law system, so they control security and they control the law. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Yeah. They own the country. Now and, you, we, and we have sat by and watched every bit of that. Now, you said that uh, uh, the first IED, improvised explosive device, mm -hmm. uh, went off uh, uh, after uh, Ambassador Brimmer uh, was there. And it was the first one. But since IEDs have become known pretty much to most Americans, and I think in our conversation with you before, you, you said they were devastating, and, the United, and we, we never – were able to come up with a countermeasure against an effective countermeasure. Is that correct? Yeah, I say that's pretty correct. We came up with countermeasures, but never anything was 100 percent. What we should have done is is we should have treated IEDs like we did like we did the atomic weapon. We should have created a Manhattan Project for IEDs and brought in the best minds and the best leadership and all that and solve that problem. We could. I mean, we got the, we have the money and and the brain power in this nation to do that type of thing. And we never, it, it never happened. Never happened. And there, there are still IEDs, still IEDs going yeah. off, yeah. Uh, going off today. Now, one of the things you you talked about, you worked with a, a lot of different military in in your stint uh, as in command and task force. Uh, uh, each military had comes up with their own their own characteristics, their own uh, mystique, or own esprit de corps, and are a little different. Kind of sets one off uh, against the other. What uh, you say you work with the uh, uh, British uh, uh, commandos? And yeah, you, had well, a, you, you mean in, in the task force? Yes. Sir. Had, yeah, yeah. I had the Brits, Spanish, Dutch, French. Well, tell us a little bit about each one of those uh, militaries and what they're, you thought. They're, they're very. They're all very interesting. They, they, uh, first of all, in the Western armies, I think in the Western armies, all the soldiers are trained pretty good. The soldiers are pretty good. Where you see the difference, where I saw the difference, is in the leadership. And the leadership has a lot to do with, the, I think, the culture of the country. So, you know, in 91, if I, if, when I put out an operations order, when I went to ball to do something, I'm moving everybody around up north, creating security zones and all that. An operations order is only good for about two hours, and then something changes it, you know, something that you didn't think of before, something you didn't anticipate changes it. And then we'll put out a frag order, fragmentary order to change that. Well, you, you put out an operations order, and then you'd have six hours later, you have to put out a fragment order that changes things a little bit. And the Americans, what you got back from the American, from the paratroopers and the Marines, 
where every four letter word they knew, and then they went and did what you had. I mean, they didn't, they didn't lose any emotion. They did it, but you had to you had to let them vent a little bit about all that. Brits, hell, that we stop. Mix tea, have tea, get the map, draw new maps and all that, and take them about six hours, and they go to, and uh, and and the French and the Spanish and the Dutch, they wanted to okay, stop, let's stop, let's start this all over again. You had made up your mind, let's do it all over. So they're different. I mean, they're. The soldiers are good, and and, uh, and the and the leaders are good, but their culture. The culture now, I think you good. remarked uh, on the marksmanship of the uh, British commandos. Did you not? Did you tell me a story about? Uh, yeah, that, that the the uh, had this corporal, this this uh, British Marine corporal was patrolling with his with his squad on a ridge line across the ridge line was one of Saddam Hussein's palaces, and Saddam Hussein had twenty one palaces up in Kurdistan. And we let him put a small guard force in each palace so to, to protect it. We allowed him to do that. And so they were patrolling, and the Iraqis, five or six of them, came running out and started shooting at the Marines. And the corporal said, uh, you know, continue to patrol. That, that their AK-47 doesn't have that much range. They won't do it. Because he was about 700 meters away, 700, 800 meters away. And so then they come out with a, with a, with a 51 cal machine gun. And old corporal looks at that and he said, okay, uh, take your position, dig in. So they'll dig in. And they come out and they load up the machine gun and they jack the first round of it and they fire off the first couple rounds and the corporal says, commence fire. And, he, and the, the, the British Marines kill all of them. And so you could walk down there and, and they were all against, they were all standing against the palace. You could walk down, you could take a cowboy hat and stick it over the, the beating pattern of the rounds. I mean, they're that, they're that accurate, but they killed all four of them, I guess. And so the Iraqi general comes flying in. I came flying in. The Iraqi general's raising hell. You know, why well, you killed my men. I said, oh, they didn't kill me. Your men fired first. And he told the turn to the to the the British uh, battalion commander, a guy named John, Jonathan Thompson, very, very good commander. And he said, you couldn't have done that from that ridge line because you're, you're, you're out of range with your weapons. He said, no, general. My queen buys a very fine rifle, and if you will stand here, I will go up there with my rifle and demonstrate it to you. <laughs> so, he didn't want that. so the next morning, about ten o'clock, I go fly into the British headquarters, commanded by a brigadier, a Victorian crosswinner from the Falklands, named uh, Andy Keeling. Good, good general, good, very good. Guy. And so I go in there, and his his S3 is there, named Rob Fry. And I said, Rob, where's Andy? He said, Ah, oh, sir, he's on a rifle range. I said, what do you mean he's on the rifle range? He said, sir, the entire brigade is on the rifle range except for those that are on limited patrols and those on outposts, but 90% of the brigade is on the rifle range. I said, Rob, we don't have a rifle range. He said, oh, we have one now, sir. We, we built it last night. I said, what the hell's going on? He said, oh, he said, the brigadier was irate over yesterday's happenings. I said, you mean he, he got mad because they killed those Iraqis? Oh, no, sir. He didn't have a problem with that. But he said it should never take 27 of Queen's rounds to kill four Iraqis. <laughs> <laughs> so, he, so he put them all in the rifle right range. <laughs> well, General, we're, we're running out of time, and uh, we could go on for, for hours. Yeah, I've, uh, enjoy, I've enjoyed it, Frank. Thank uh, you very much. Well, we've enjoyed it. And again, I want to thank you, sir, for your years of service to this. Well, and uh, It's the it's, the, the best job you could have. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a brotherhood, and I love it. Wish I could do it all over again. Well, thank, I thank you again, sir, and uh, thanks very much. Yeah. God bless you. Thank, thank you. you. This is a project authorized by Congress and administered by the Library of Congress. The objective is to interview and record as the story as many as possible of those veterans from World War II to the present. The Library of Congress archives these and makes them available to the public both in person and online. The library also encourages local venues such as historical societies and museums like the one we're in at the present time, the New Smyrna Museum of History, to house these and make them available to the local population.